Good evening, everyone. Welcome those of us joining both in person and remotely via Zoom tonight. For those of you I haven't met before, I'm Clara, Member Engagement Manager at The Inn. Thank you for very much for coming along to the event tonight discussing appointments. The talk will last just over an hour, including a half hour Q&A session. Scheduled to finish at around 7.30 and then we'll host a drinks reception next door for in-person attendees. And if you are joining us remotely, please type any questions you have for our panel using the Q&A button on the Zoom banner. Please don't use the chat function for this just so that we can streamline all the questions into the Q&A button. And those attending in person will be invited to raise their hand if you do have any questions following the talk. And Anna, my colleague, will bring the mic over for you. So I'm now going to hand you over to Bryn Moore Adams from Exchange Chambers, who's a member of the sub Social Mobility Subcommittee and the Attorney General's Regional B Panel. Bryn Moore will be chairing tonight's event. Thank you, Clara. As Clara said, this is an event put on by the INS Social Mobility Subcommittee. Um, so whilst we're talking about appointments, the emphasis is on um, social mobility. The idea is um, that by providing information about the appointments process, we help demystify um, the appointments process and make it easier for everyone to complete, compete on a level playing field. Um, the speakers we have tonight um, are covering two key types of appointments you can um, obtain to help um, progress your career at the bar. Um, one from the Digital Appointments Commission, who's going to talk about um, part-time judicial appointments. Um, and we've got two speakers from the Government Legal Department who are going to talk about appointments to the Attorney General's panels. Um, Turning to those speakers, we have, um, first of all, on, on the left, uh, Lorna Robertson, who's from the Government Legal Department. Lorna qualified in Scotland and has been a government lawyer for 17 years. She is a Deputy Director in GLD's Litigation Group. Um, she's a Diversity and Inclusion Lead and a Career Mentor. And she's joined by Sean Wilson, who is a barrister. Um, he has been a government lawyer for his whole career. He's also a deputy director in um, GLD's litigation group. He's chair of GLD's race network and is a diversity and inclusion lead in the litigation group. Um, on my right, we have Bree Stevens for Queen's Council. Um, she is a professional commissioner at the Judicial Appointments Commission. Um, she's also a venture of this in, joint head of Gatehouse Chambers, um, a QC specializing in property litigation, um, a fee-paid first-time tier, first tier tribunal judge in the land registration chamber of the property chamber. Um, and when she's not doing all of that, she also um, does EDI um, issues across the bar, which if I listed them all, we wouldn't have time for anything else. Um, so we're going to um, start with a, an introduction um, from our speakers from GLD. We're going to talk about the um, panel appointments process. Thank you very much indeed, Rinmore, and uh, welcome everyone. It's a great honour to uh, be here today and, uh, uh, well, such esteemed company. Perhaps I should up sticks and run for the door immediately, but I shall, I shall soldier on. Um, we are going to talk today about the panel council process and uh, crucially we hope to be able to give you a few uh, pointers and to help demystify uh, what the process is, what uh, panel council are all about and uh, how uh, you can hopefully strengthen your potential applications uh, so as to be successful. Uh, to appear as an advocate on behalf of the Crown, as I'm sure Bryn Moore would attest, is a great privilege. And being a member of the Attorney General's Civil Panel gives the opportunity to work on some of the most important and high profile cases of the day. Cases of great public interest and legal complexity. Now, it might help as well to tell you a little bit about what the panel council structure is. The Attorney General maintains panels of junior counsel to undertake civil and EU work for all government departments. These are in addition to any standing counsel that there are for departments and also the first Treasury Council, Sir James EDQC. The panel system is made up of London panels, regional panels of which um, uh, uh, Brynmore is a member, and also the public international law panel. 
And each of those are set up on an A, B and C structure. So the A panel deals with the most complex government cases in all kinds of courts and tribunals. Members are often, well, uh, often appear against and are expected to appear regularly against QCs. In general, members of the A panel uh, have over 10 years advocacy experience. Then there's the B panel, and uh, B panelists are expected to have between five and 10 years of advocacy experience. They deal with substantial cases, but not in general ones quite as complex as those handled by the A panel. Members uh, are generally instructed where knowledge and experience of a particular field is required. And then there's the C panel and uh, C panelists generally have between two and five years advocacy experience. Uh, although those with more experience can and indeed, uh, and indeed do apply. Uh, those appointed to the C panel will often, but not always be um, expected to become A panelists in uh, due course. And so will be expected to show the aptitude and skill set. Um, required to uh, progress through to the A panel in due course. Now, the selection process itself is a rigorous one, and the quality of the advocacy is high. The number of serving panel members who take silk every year is certainly a testament to this, and to the help that being on the panel can give one's career. Uh, benefits of working uh, as a panel uh, member can include uh, the benefits of you know, working as part of a team, uh, gaining experience of working in the higher courts, uh, working with litigants in person, and from time to time, uh, the uh, constant risk of uh, media handling. Uh, Lorna, over to you to say a bit. I will pick up from, from there, and I just wanted to, to um, make everybody uh, make it clear to everybody that the attorney's committed to making significant strides in promoting and delivering diversity and inclusion on the civil panels. Um, we're always looking to widen the pool and we've publicised the competition and the assistance that's available. We've published that widely um, and that, that includes with um, quite a lot of diversity groups. Um, we hold recruitment events where we can go through the application process, highlighting the benefits and the flexibility that a panel member can expect and answer questions that people have, obviously. Um, we offer a mentoring service with existing panel members, and we do collect or diversity data from candidates, but it's, it's obviously held uh, confidential. It's very strictly held. Um, that just tells us more about the characteristics of people applying to the panels. Um, and um, that's something obviously that doesn't go before selection boards. Um, it, panel members also can suspend appointments. Um, you can have extensions for a number of reasons, um, including parental and caring leave. So again, we can talk a bit about flexibility and um, of the panels in due course. But that's just a flavour of uh, direction of um, the attorney's views on promoting and delivering diversity and inclusion. And you might be asking, well, what... <clears throat> Uh, what are you looking for in applicants? Well, hopefully you're asking that because I'm going to try and answer that now anyway. Uh, but the type of work that uh, panel members will be instructed on is incredibly varied and runs the full gamut from public law through to employment, personal injury, planning, social security, inquiry work. We're not expecting uh, new panel members to be fully trained at the outset of their appointment. What we're looking for more is experience of advocacy, transferable skills, if the area of law in which they're presently working isn't an area that GLD um, would um, uh, particularly require. Uh, and above all, enthusiasm and flexibility. We also expect candidates to have an idea of the type of work that uh, they are likely to be involved in. Mm, thank you. And the, uh, the GLD panel council team run both, as Sean's touched on already, both the regional and the London competitions on behalf of the attorney. There's a six week application window for candidates to submit the application. So you've got eligibility requirements, details of advocacy, advocacy and advisory experience. Um, and details and guidance are provided before the competition at the recruitment events and on gov.uk 
websites. Candidates also need to provide references. Um, if a candidate needs more information or clarification, then they have the panel council team contact details. Um, applications are divided into specialisms where possible, and they're scored by selection board for each of the, the panels, as uh, Sean's mentioned, A, B, and C. And the panels are made up of senior lawyers um, for the particular specialism across the government departments um, and a panel of so current panel members as well and a bar council representative sit on the, sit on the boards. Um, we do not ask about the school or university. Selection boards are not told the name of the candidates chambers. That's not uh, visible to them. Uh, the board is looking at the evidence that's been provided by the candidate in the application form. And there's a moderation process also for applications to be looked by, at by different assessors um, where scores are just below the pass mark. So. And in terms of how can you best go about preparing an application to the panel, um, it's really important to do the basics. So there's a lot of guidance that is available already, and there are frequently asked questions please 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 look at that guidance look at those questions it's important to plan to allow yourself enough time in order to uh, prepare the application it's certainly not something that can be you know, knocked up like a last minute essay crisis uh, on on a weekend it needs thought it needs consideration um, talk to other panel members ask the panel council team for a mentor or go about finding um, one of your own. Uh, find out more about the type of work that a panel member would be doing and decide which panel level uh, you might apply for as we uh, touched on earlier. Um, whilst the majority of uh, potential applicants apply for the C panel and move through, uh, there is nothing, at least in theory, to prevent you from uh, applying for the B panel um, at first instance. Um, make use of the application to showcase your skills and your experience. Be clear about what is uh, being asked for. Use the word count. Um, uh, I know that um, uh, as uh, barristers, we are not often accused of, of um, uh, uh, being um, yeah, uh, economical in our use of language, but do make sure that you use up the word count, sell yourself as much as you humanly can in that application. Um, and uh, candidates should use the additional information section as well for anything that they think that the selection board might need to take into account that isn't covered elsewhere. And appointments are for five years, but panel members, you can apply to the next panel level before that five years is up. Um, and as um, Sean says, you can apply to B or A if without having been a previous panel member. Um, there's, there is an expectation that panel members, panel council will graduate through the different panel levels, um, assuming that you wish to do so. Um, and panel members provide a list of specialisms that teams will use when looking to instruct council. So it's very helpful for us as instructing solicitors to know who's specialising in what. Um, so it's important that the panel council review their list and add any areas that they might want to develop and so on. And uh, finally, uh, it, it would be, it, well, it's important to land the message about work-life balance. Uh, I'm sure that some of you will uh, be asking or wondering, is it possible to balance an appointment to the panel with uh, part-time working or parental or caring um, responsibilities? And the simple answer is yes. The Attorney General recognises that panel members have a work-life balance to achieve, which includes their private practice. We've already mentioned that panel appointments can be extended to reflect time away from practice, and there is no expectation for council to undertake a specific number of instructions per year, for example. So uh, council could accept a case if they are available to do so, but there is no uh, quota, for example, of a certain number of cases that have to be taken in the course of a person's appointment. So that's all that we wanted to say. Um, that's wonderful. Um, I think now we're going to have a um, same sort of introduction from um, Bree. The clicker. Like the judicial process. Mm. Bree has prepared slides. So mm -hmm. it's uh, that.
Yeah, I thought there were going to be slides from everyone. So <laughs> <laughs> for once, I was a girly swap. I thought. <laughs> uh, let's see if this works. Which way do I have to? Okay, Clara. I'll start. <laughs> you can. Anyway, as you heard from Bryn, I am one of the two professional commissioners at the JAC. Uh, the JAC has been around for 15 years. It's created by statute. It has three statutory duties, which are to select solely on merit, to select only people of good character, and to encourage diversity in the range of people who are available for selection. So if you like, the first is about selection, the second is about gatekeeping in terms of good character, and the third diversity is about the pool and encouraging the pool and, and enabling the pool to move up to selection. Uh, the commission in the sense of the board that I'm a part of, there's 15 of us, and by statute, we have to have a lay person as a chair, a member of the senior judiciary as a vice chair. Uh, there are five other judicial members, two professional members, myself and Sarah Lee, who's a solicitor, uh, five lay members, and one non-legally qualified judicial member. So there's a huge range. And if you want to get into our diversity characteristics, they're pretty... Uh, surprisingly ranged as well. You can see us all on the website. So we effectively are responsible for overseeing both the operation of the JAC as a whole from staff, finance, everything, but also the actual competitions. And so in terms of looking after fair selection, uh, a starting point is every single competition that is run has a commissioner assigned to it who is responsible for overseeing it, working with the staff, making sure everything's on track and reporting back to the commission when it gets to the point where we're actually considering and making the recommendations. Uh, just a few pointers around what we do to ensure that we are as far as can be achieved and obviously understanding and techniques are constantly developing and we work hard to be at the forefront of that. But other things we're doing, it's fair selection training for panels. All our panelists, our lay panelists, are regularly given overarching training. But beyond that, within every competition, when a panel is being briefed for the competition with the materials, part of that is a discussion again uh, between the panelists about fair selection, about themselves and how they know they operate. Uh, in the context of selection and really very constructive discussions about being open about what they know their preference is and the things that jar for them are and an agreement about pulling each other up on that uh, and challenging each other. And we also ensure that a quantity of the interviews are observed. So as the commissioner assigned, I would uh, observe some and senior JAC staff also observe. So we can see that across uh, interviews as far as possible, there is a common experience for candidates and nothing uh, that would give us concern. Selection materials are reviewed not only by the JAC staff, but also by an advisory group, which has representatives from various stakeholders, the professions, uh, interested parties, some particular um, interest groups in terms of our underrepresented groups and the like. Uh, we have increasingly introduced name, name blind sifting for shortlisting. Uh, and as technology has developed, that is becoming more and more effective. You'll appreciate some competitions we run are quite small. We're looking for one candidate for something. Others, any of you who engaged in, will know that we've got thousands of people applying for several hundred uh, appointments on occasion. So how we work that can vary. Uh, you heard reference to uh, calibration and moderation. That is something where we've got big competitions, particularly 
uh, we have to be very careful about. So calibration is making sure that a single panel is talking amongst itself. Multiple panels are talking to each other about what is a, what a good candidate looks like, what a, a candidate providing insufficient evidence looks like, and checking in in the course of their uh, work uh, on candidates to make sure that they are all approaching it as much as possible. So not only are there observers with eyes on looking at different panels to check consistency, but they are talking to each other to encourage that. And then moderation where there is any uh, selection process with an individual candidate, which there might be something unusual about or problematic. We had a competition I was recently involved in uh, a gentleman on a bike with very loud speakers who would go past at three o'clock every afternoon past the building that we were holding the selection days in. So it was inevitably nothing we could do about it, but disruptive for candidates. So those interviews will go for moderation for people to have a look back at, at the evidence that's been produced, if necessary, a listen back uh, to the interview and see if there's any concern, if there's any disruption, and if we're uh, happy that uh, the assessment has been done fairly. Uh, so another thing to mention is the equal merit provision. Uh, that is, as a matter of uh, statute, something we are entitled to apply. So where is the commission, we conclude that two or more candidates are of the same merit. And given the number of appointments that we're being asked to recommend for, that group sits across the cutoff cut point, uh, then provided we have robustly questioned and tested with ourselves whether they really are of equal merit, we can then lift uh, the veil as it were and look to see if they come from any of our underrepresented groups. Now, we have underrepresented groups in a generic sense that we're looking to encourage women, the disabled, black and ethnic minority candidates and solicitors. But when we apply the equal merit test in a competition, we do check that actually it's an underrepresented group for the role or the group of roles that we're looking at. And if we have equal merit for a group and an underrepresented group, then we lift the veil and we will give priority to those that come from the underrepresented groups. So, vacancies. Uh, we now have a situation where they are coming through on a fairly steady basis, which we think is better for candidates, better for selection, that you don't feel oh, there's an app application process for X, I have to apply now because who knows when that will come up again. We're trying to keep it on an even keel going along. The reality is the vast majority of people have to apply multiple times because particularly for barristers, we're not used to this sort of assessment and recruitment process. Getting to understand the process can take a while. Plus, frankly, it's a numbers game. There are a certain number of vacancies to be filled. Who knows? We can make predictions. We're fairly good about them. How many will apply? Where do you fall on the day with what you put forward in terms of evidence on that merit list? We have lots of people who are selectable who we're not able to recommend because we haven't got that many vacancies. So, you know, keep going, keep trying, and hopefully with that sort of uh, timetable and rolling applications, uh, that becomes much better uh, for everyone. So a bit about the selection process. As I've said, what comes into the JAC is a vacancy request. We're told we want X of Y. It will define whether it's fee paid or salaried. It will define the level, level of judge. Sometimes it's defined by jurisdiction. Sometimes it's a generic. So the district judge competitions, the recorder competitions generally are generic. At the moment, I'm assigned commissioner for a circuit judge competition, which is a generic competition, but we're also looking at crime, family and civil, just to make life complicated. So the application will then, the exercise will be advertised. Generally, advertising through to closing date is about two weeks. Now there is some forewarning. 
The really important thing is if you're interested, go onto the website, JSE website, register, register for alerts for any of the roles you think you're interested in, and then you will get as much warning as possible as to what's coming up, when it's coming, now it's open, uh, now you have this period to apply. When you're putting in an application, uh, you put in a self-assessment, that is against uh, competency uh, criteria, and I'll come to that in a moment, and you also identify independent assessors, two people who will also be providing an assessment. You have to be eligible. We do some non-legally qualified roles, but I'll only talk about legally qualified here. Uh, generally, you need to be between five and seven years, depending on the level of judiciary involved, uh, post-qualification. And in some exercises, there are other specific criteria because of the role and the demands of the role. Generally, for salaried roles, uh, the Lord Chancellor expects and the President of Tribunals expects, but not quite so much, uh, that you will have had sitting experience already. Occasionally it's left open, and occasionally people who don't have sitting experience can get straight through onto a salaried role, but that's very rare. Shortlisting uh, is done using a variety of methods, which largely depend on the type of the size of the competition. So if it's a small competition, the shortlisting is likely to be done by reference to the application form, namely the self-assessment and the independent assessment. In one of the very big competitions, uh, then we use online tools, qualifying tests, which involve multiple choice, critical uh, reasoning and uh, scenario tests, situational judgment tests. If you get through shortlisting, and I think I said, but we use the equal merit provision at that point, as well as at selection day. Uh, if you get through, you go to a selection day. Your selection day will involve two parts, a competency-based interview and one other selection tool, which typically would be a role play, situational questioning, or possibly a presentation. Presentation's more likely for a leadership role. Your panel will be generally consist of three people, two lay people, one of whom will be the chair and a member of the judiciary, usually a member of the judiciary that's one rank above the role that we're recruiting for. The materials are all drafted by judges, but they are, as I've said, robustly tested by JSC staff, the advisory body and dry runs, if you remember nothing else from this, dry runs, I'll come back to. Um, in terms of character checks, we ask you for full and frank disclosure. My advice is be absolutely full and frank and if in doubt, disclose it, because we do do checks with professional bodies, etc. And if we discover something that you didn't tell us about, that in itself is a huge question mark over character. And as you will recall, statutory duty is to only select those of good character. So full and frank is all good. And once we have had selection days, reports produced by the panels, a merit list produced, if necessary, uh, the EMP lined up, it goes to uh, the commission. We look at all of that. We make the ultimate decision about who is being recommended, and then it having come in as a, vac a vacancy request to the JAC, it goes out as a recommendation to the appropriate authority, which might be the Lord Chancellor, the Lord Chief, or the President of Tribunals. So at the heart of this, your lawyers, you are used to knowing a legal test, a which are criteria, and applying evidence. That is exactly what you need to do when you're applying. You will see for every single competition, and if you look at the silk application process, it's the same, you will see a competency framework. Sometimes with senior roles, we call it skills and abilities, but the process is the same. So these are the headline competencies that are used time and time again. Leadership is generally for some roles, the others, almost all roles have all four. 
what you will find for each competition is under those headings, there are bullet points. The bullet points reflect the particular role, the particular skills that fall under these headings that are needed. Your job is to provide evidence that you either have these abilities, these competencies, or are able to acquire them very quickly. You provide that evidence by your self-assessment, by the evidence that your independent assessors will provide, by the uh, material you give as a result of taking part in the role play and the competency-based interview, et cetera. All we're looking for is evidence. We don't want assertion. We don't want to be told that someone else has thought you've got skills because they've given you X role. That's not evidence that you actually have the skills. What we want is evidence. And that means giving examples, being able to describe an occasion when you demonstrated X. Okay, so we often talk in the context of when I listen to panels and when we talk uh, at the commission about positive evidence and an absence of evidence or insufficient evidence, sometimes there's negative evidence, but usually it is about what is the positive evidence? Is there enough? Is there sufficient evidence? And as I say, it's very difficult to turn it on yourself, but it is a process that we are used to doing in other contexts. So in, with that in mind, I would say prepare thoroughly, and this reflects some of what uh, you heard from Sean. Uh, you need to spend the time thinking, looking at that competency framework, thinking about the occasions when, examples of you demonstrating. And I would say as a rough guide, in order to tell the story that demonstrates bullet point three under exercising judgment, you need to think, identify the occasion and think about how you can express that so that you set the scene, talk about the action, which is your thinking, what you did, how you decided that, how you changed that, how you responded in the situation and the outcome. Scene, action, outcome. But the action, what you actually did, what you thought, how you approached it, has to be at least 70% of what you're saying. Because that is the real nub of the evidence that demonstrates you have the competencies, you have the skills and abilities. That is really hard to dig out of yourself, but that is what you need to do. Personally, when I've had to do it, I have found talking to both lawyers who do what I do and non-lawyers is quite a useful way of doing that. But that is, the for me, the preparation. You need to come into completing the application form or into a selection day with lots of examples at your fingertips so that when they decide which bit of the competency framework they're asking you about, you have examples, evidence there. So that's me banging on about that a bit. Learning about the role is a clearly an important thing. It's hard to persuade people. You really are able to do something if you don't understand what the something is. So take any opportunities you can, you know, engaging through the ins, through any other mechanism, with judges, with people who are performing the roles you're interested in, people who've been through the JSC and the QC process to learn about those processes, but that's another route. Um, and things like uh, the PAGE, which is a pre-application judicial education program, which is a collaboration between Bar Council, Law Society, Silex, uh, and the JAC. So you can find it on any of their websites. Other support for candidates. JAC website, register on it, dig in it, keep digging, go back to it regularly. There is an awful lot of material there, and we're constantly working on putting more information and more tools to help people. There are case studies there, there are examples of competency frameworks and all sorts of things. I've mentioned the page scheme, dry runs. Register on the JAC website that you're willing to participate in dry runs. We test the materials for selection days with dry run candidates 
with some of our panels and the drafting judges to make sure they work. You can't do it if you're gonna enter the competition because you'll have seen the materials. But if you think I might want to go in the next round for recorders, this round volunteer, have a run at doing the materials, tell us where we've got them wrong and doesn't, what doesn't work. But you also have the experience of what it's like to do one of the role plays or the situational questioning. You will have more judges than you would have on your actual selection day. And those judges as the payback for you helping us will privately with you give you feedback. So you'll have the experience of doing it and know what to expect on the day when you get to your actual application. But you'll also have had some feedback from a number of judges who are used to sitting on our panels uh, and seeing candidates. So they really know what they're talking about when they tell you, you would come as a strong candidate or you need to fix this and this in order to get you to that place. Um, that's probably enough of all of that. And places for more information. I'll perhaps leave that up for a little moment. I think that's me banging on for more than enough time. Thanks, Bree. Um, so I prepared some questions, but made the mistake of giving them to the panelists in advance, and they've now answered all of them. <laughs> um, Sorry. But the good news is we've got a flood of questions um, coming in from attendees, and some asked them in advance. Um, one of the popular subjects is competency-based selection. Um, and th this might be a useful worked example, I don't know. Mm. Um, so um, Jack asks, um, I'm not sure if this is specifically about panel appointments or judicial appointments, um, how can an applicant provide evidence of an awareness of the importance of diversity and evidence of taking an anti-discriminatory approach beyond merely stating that one is so aware and does take such an approach in each and every case? How does one provide evidence where there are no specific examples of such practice because it is so routine and ingrained? Uh, if it's so routine and ingrained, I would say you would have an awful lot of examples. You would be able to identify an occasion where you were able to understand because of a particular client or a particular witness, their, you know, their cultural context and how that means they need to be communicated with or disabilities and how you adjusted, how you spoke to them. You know, people come in and they talk about realizing clients have a disability and actually how they decide to get the information about what is actually going to assist the client and then making arrangements in terms of timings and breaks or how they frame questions or providing information in advance all those sort of things which demonstrate you looked at the particular individual their context their needs driven by whatever aspect of their characteristics and made adjustments in how you engaged with them and worked with them to make it work for them. I don't know if you... Um, yeah, in terms of, um, I mean, I suppose applicants have to, they have to sort of provide how the information about how they um, you know, meet the eligibility requirements and in terms of, you know, their experiences of dealing with, say, litigants and persons and understanding um, the needs of particular parties that they're representing. Um, in terms of their application, it's, really, it's, it's that complexity and range um, of experiences and advisory and advocacy, and also lessons learned. So I guess it's, there's not that specific sort of question as such, but it, it sort of runs through, I guess, your understanding of I mean, what the needs of um, requirements of being a panel council for a government work. Um, so I can, you know, to understand all of that, all of that, and draw that out. I guess in your the advocacy and the advisory examples and the lessons learned and the question about the demands, special demands of government litigation as well. So, yeah. On a, a similar question, then. Um, this was directed at Brie, but I suspect is applicable to everyone. Um, 
I'm not at all sure what sort of examples are persuasive in evidencing each of the competencies in the assessment framework. Could you please give me an example um, of some anonymous illustrations of examples which have persuaded you as additional appointments commissioner and examples which have not? Um, that's a little hard to do in a vacuum in the sense that obviously one deals with um, appointments for different roles where the, although the headline competencies are the same, the quality of what you're looking for or the focus of what you're looking for does change. But if I can perhaps try to be helpful. So for instance, um, building and acquiring knowledge, you might have a candidate who comes in and talks about uh, an example of being confronted with a case with a very short time span where the case involved an area of law they knew nothing about and they described the process that they went through in order to put themselves in a position, say, by that afternoon to have a conference or do the hearing or whatever it is. Um, if they say, I ran down the corridor and I asked X, who I know to be an expert, who gave me a quick brain dump, that's, it is evidence of, you know, some ability to do that, but it's not the best. If what they say is, right, I went to these resources in terms of legal reports, I Googled, say it's some, I don't know, psychology thing. I Googled various websites. I knew there was an organization that did this. I found, you know, a podcast that told me that. I then um, looked in, um, I don't know, Oxford University's psychology department and I found this, this and this. You know, so it's someone who's doing a range and finding a very um, comprehensive and rich way in the limited time they've got in order to put that together. Similarly, someone might say, well, actually I volunteered to give the training on this subject and I had two weeks to put that together. So what I did was this, this and this. And because I knew my knowledge gap was this technical aspect, I actually persuaded an expert to come along and do the training with me, which meant I enhanced my own knowledge as well as sharing it with others those would be rich evidence of understanding the variety of ways in which you can acquire and build knowledge. For what it's worth, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I, <laughs> I, and we would be looking for a similar awareness, a, a similar level of you know, reflection uh, and um, uh, yeah, appreciation of the uh, effect of particular experiences on that candidate and it's those it's that kind of awareness uh, uh, that marks the average applications um, uh, well marks the brilliant and really good uh, applications from just the average and mediocre ones and in relation to the Attorney General's uh, panel selection process, um, we specifically ask the uh, candidates to, um, uh, to talk about lessons learned from particular experiences. And we also ask them to um, demonstrate a particular appreciation and awareness of the special demands of litigating on behalf of and for government and it's through those answers I think that we particularly um, are inviting the candidates to show um, the, the humility almost that um, is necessary uh, the uh, awareness to learn from things so uh, it, it's not just about um, a stellar list of cases saying, I won this with this terribly clever point here, and I won that case there by my uh, astounding uh, courtroom advocacy. Uh, but what I think distinguishes the really good um, uh, applications are when someone says, well, actually, that particular experience that I had on X occasion didn't go well, but I reflected on X occasion 
and I learnt and developed lessons. I changed my approach to things. And when Y opportunity came around, I applied those lessons and produced a great result um, uh, as an outcome. So uh, hopefully that, that kind mm. of um, addresses the question as well. I, I think Sean's right. And he put it very well when he talked about awareness and reflection. So possessing and building knowledge is not about saying, I clearly have a lot of knowledge about X because I won in the Supreme Court arguing about it. Because as a judge, you're going to be confronted regularly with things you don't know about. So what we need to know is, yes, you have knowledge, but you have the ability to build knowledge. So it is that humility, that awareness of how you learn what you can do always to be better, to do more, to go that extra step and being able to articulate how you approach that, which takes quite a lot of self-reflection, which we don't do very often because <laughs> we're constantly running on to the next case. You know, we beat ourselves up about what went wrong and then we run on to the next case as opposed to, and I think internally we are reflecting and learning and going on, but we're not very conscious about it. And it's learning to be conscious and be able to articulate it. Um, right, moving on to a completely different subject that seems to be quite popular is age. There's a load of questions about age both at both ends of the spectrum. Um, so at, at the top end, um, Francesca asks, um, although the appointments process takes account of equality, diversity, inclusion, and social mobility, as a 62-year-old student barrister, I'm continually treated differently because of my age. Could the panel offer advice to help circumnavigate age discrimination? Um, and, and separately, it was um, asked specifically about judicial appointments, my anonymous um, questioner. Um, is there a particular expectation in terms of how many years um, the JSC expects candidates to serve once appointed? And is there an emphasis on appointing younger candidates as a result? Um, shall I answer that first, last bit first? There isn't an emphasis on appointing. It's a, sort of, a, it's one of those, <laughs> when did you last beat your wife questions, isn't it? <laughs> um, for different roles, there is a standard reasonable period of service. And that is not something the JAC determines. We are told how many to recruit and we are told what is the reasonable years service for that role. And so if someone is not given where the retirement age is at the time, able to provide those reasonable years of service, then although there is an exceptional circumstances get out, generally they will not be appointed. Um, but, you know, retirement ages move, the business case and what informs what is a reasonable period. They're not in our control, they're what we work with. So that is a sort of, at the senior end, that is a limiting factor. Beyond that, age is not a feature of the judicial selection process. In fact, with the JAC, there are increasingly younger appointments and we generally think that is great because there are increasing numbers of fee paid appointments. There are people who conclude that actually the crazy lives that our profession brings is not necessarily ideal for them. You get people putting together portfolio judicial careers in terms of having a number of fee paid appointments that they do for a number of years until they actually want a salaried one, which gives a lot of flexibility. So actually the diversity of certainly at the, the entry points uh, and the fee paid roles of the judiciary and in the tribunals is being increased by the fact that people are using that flexibility and are stepping into those roles perhaps earlier in their career than 15 years ago people would have thought about doing. So there's certainly no other than you have to have been qualified and in practice or you know, qualified for the five or seven, depending on the level of the role and the year's service thing, they are the age factors, but that aside, age is irrelevant to us. 
Um, I suppose it, it I suppose C panel applicants mm. are probably typically more junior in terms of practice terms and yeah, probably typically. also in age yeah. as a result. Yeah. Typically. Um, mm. In terms of the first question, those two questions mm. from Francesca, um, <clears throat> is there, is age a relevant factor? And if, um, if not, um, what can older applicants do to um, improve their chances, I suppose? Well, I, think, I mean, the Attorney General appoints the best candidates and that's irrespective of age. So it's, it's looking at the evidence on the application and so in the same way as, as it is for everybody, really. So regardless of age, it's demonstrating the good examples in the advocacy and the advisory, et cetera. And, and that's, that's the crux of it. And, and yes, at the C panel a, um, level, you have to have that between two, usually people between two and five years advocacy experience, but you need that two years advocacy experience. So, um, but that's, but it, it's, you know, it's not age related. Um, on, a, on a similar note, um, Julian asked, um, if a barrister who has more than five years advocacy experience joins the C panel, can um, he or she apply to move up to the B panel within a couple of years, or do they need to spend the full five years on C panel before they move up? Um, my strong understanding is that uh, someone in that position wouldn't need to spend mm the full uh, term of the appointment. So uh, if they considered themselves um, ready, mm -hmm. uh, then there is nothing in the system that would prevent them from uh, making an application. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was told it was a good idea to make your application before the last year of your appointment. Um, in case it doesn't go well, you accidentally <laughs> <laughs> find yourself not you on the panel yes. anymore um, yeah. while, you, while you wait to reapply. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, the, um, um, right, so not to be accused of, of dodging the difficult questions. Um, an anonymous person says, um, asks, um, panel council rates have remained unchanged for about 20 years. Is this facilitating diversity and inclusion on the panel? <laughs> That's that's probably we do. I don't know what the answer to that question is. Very, that's not a kind of straightforward answer. I don't think to, in terms of uh, they they are they are what they are, and I'm not sure what uh, if there's a if Susanna can give us some input on this one or or Simon who's on the Zoom. I mean, you probably it okay. it probably depends on the facts there, doesn't yeah. it? Because for some people, if you're in a <laughs> commercial practice area yeah. and join panel, your hourly rate is going to be quite a lot lower on panel than it mm, is in commercial yes. practice, but the differential in different areas of law is probably smaller. And, yeah. and, and you know, the, the quality of work and the opportunity to do lots of fantastic, interesting, complex areas of work, you know, that, that's, that's what you get from being on the panel. Absolutely, so, yeah. absolutely. I mean, it's much, it's much the same rationale actually mm. as to, why the likes of Lorna and I are lawyers in government. Mm. You know, we certainly didn't join mm. the GLD in order to uh, retire to the south of France in you know, a year or 40. two. <laughs> uh, um, but what we did join mm. for was the um, opportunity to work on some of the most urgent and important issues mm. of the day, uh, to work collegiately with some brilliant mm. um, uh, colleagues, uh, to uh, be involved in uh, some uh, absolutely fascinating uh, issues of law and policy and to make a difference. We certainly didn't join for the remuneration. Mm -hmm. And I think similar arguments can be made in relation to uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, 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 the, uh, remuneration, uh, the hourly rates in relation to um, panel council. Mm. But outside of that, it's um, out with mm. our paid rate, <laughs> so we're not going to go any further but on that. But you've also <laughs> you say it's regrettable yeah. um, that panel's mm. increased in the same way it's regrettable mm. that your pay rates haven't increased. <laughs> um, but I think you can also say that over the period of those 20 years, the panels are far more diverse now than mm. they were 20 years ago. So there may not be too much of a correlation. Mm. I do can see that there might be a correlation or it might be off-putting, particularly in the socioeconomic um, mobility mm. area, if 
colleagues are more reliant on more remunerative rem well-paid work <laughs> <laughs> it's late <laughs> it is, yeah uh, but that being said mm. um we absolutely encourage people to mix and match their panel yes. work with, with their private, private practice yeah. work um uh, and would encourage mm. uh, people to pursue it on yeah. that basis and you've also got i mean the government legal department as instructing solicitors, we are over two and a half thousand, about two and a half thousand people, 1800 of whom are solicitors and barristers. And we're looking at the Attorney General's panel list to instruct counsel. So that's a lot of, it's a lot of people looking at a list of people. And there's a lots of opportunities for instructions, I would say. Um, right. Um, a different question, which I think probably applies to both, although it's been asked about panel um, references. Um, Laura asks, what advice would you give to um, applicants in identifying and approaching appropriate um, referees? That was about judicial applications, but I think it probably applies to mm -hmm. panel applications mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, and an anonymous attendee asks, um, does the panel still require references from High Court judges, for example, for a B panel mm -hmm. appointment? Mm -hmm. Do you want to go first? Um, Searching desperately. Yes, for oh, shall I go? Yes. <laughs> I'll go but, 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 um, can you go first? Yes. Thank you. The independent assessments, it varies slightly between competitions. Sometimes it does tell you, for instance, um, in terms of a barrister, it would be expected that you would have a head of chambers or someone in a similar position um, to that. But there's a request for two. It is not who it comes from. What matters, again, is the evidence. So you need to choose people who really have seen your work and really can talk about your competency in relation to the competency framework, who will take the time to do that and understand what is meant when they're being asked to provide evidence of that. Because an independent assessment that just says, X is an excellent advocate is not evidence. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it says I was against X and they had this problem and they managed by doing X, Y, and Z to persuade a judge to change their mind, that is evidence. So that's what you need. People who will take the time and understand what's being asked and actually provide the evidence. Did that give you time? It yeah. did. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that what the A panel candidates, they need five references, two of which should be from members of the judiciary. Um, and in terms of the judicial referees, the most valuable references are from those who have seen the candidates on their feet on more than one occasion. So a reference from Circuit Judge O'Connor, who has clear experience of a, a candidate's ability uh, in court, is of greater assistance than a, say, a Supreme Court judge who hasn't really seen you on your feet. Um, so they, um, yes, so it, it's judicial references is the, is the requirement there. Um, and below a panel, three references, at least one of which should be from a member of the judiciary. Is correct. It's the are, same, so it's the same point as three mates, isn't it? It's the it's the quality, quality of it's the, the quality, evidence. And, oh, for all for all references, and really important that you to think you know well ahead of who you think will be able to give you a quality reference and give them enough notice because the references are you know they can take if you if you know they can take a while to prepare, so it's not a last minute job to sort of contact somebody and ask them to prepare it. So. Absolutely. And, and to that, I would add that um, if, as a candidate, you have had exposure to um, government work, perhaps uh, by virtue of uh, having acted as a junior junior, uh, then uh, it can be a very good idea indeed to uh, consider um, approaching a member of the government legal department to be a referee. Mm -hmm and uh, we are asked to do that from time to time and uh, uh, are in appropriate cases very uh, happy to do so. So um, do please uh, yeah, be creative 
um, in who you choose. Don't, don't feel um, bound to only uh, seek um, you know, a judicial one or um, uh, from a particular level. Uh, if there is someone uh, in the GLD uh, who could potentially provide you with reference then then do. Um, equally, uh, when I was uh, considering C panel applications uh, this year, there were a few people who uh, uh, had instructing solicitors uh, as referees. Uh, and again, that is um, uh, perfectly permissible. If you use an instructing solicitor, is it best to have one that's been in court with you? Or Certainly, if people, if as much evidence as you can provide of advo your advocacy skills, mm. I think is, is good. The quality, mm. yeah, quality. I'm conscious that it's very easy for people online to, to ask questions because they pop up on the screen in front of me. Does anyone in the room have a, have a question they want to ask? How are, how are lay members um, appointed on the panels? Yeah. Um, we go through a competency-based uh, competition to select. Uh, most of them are, there's a lot of civil servants um, and HR professionals. So people who, and, and what they're being examined for is nothing to do with legal knowledge. It is to do with recruitment process, understanding that ability to assess and what it, because we have on any legal um, selection, we have a judicial member. So we've got legal knowledge in the room. They also have um, the materials that have been drafted and indicators to them as to what the sort of key points would be. Actually, what they can do as lay people, although they do get quite familiar with stuff if they're with us for years, um, is see whether the judge craft bits, which are about working and communicating with others, <laughs> actually being able to convey in simple terms that members of the public who were in court could understand complicated concepts. So they're not selected for anything to do with legal knowledge and ability. They're not lawyers. They absolutely are people who are embedded in their own careers and history with the selection processes and that critical analysis of what is being put in front of them. And we've had a huge drive to improve the diversity of our panels. So in fact, gender is probably, I would say anecdotally, I haven't looked at the statistics on gender lately, but I would say anecdotally, it's more female than male. Um, and we've increased our, I hate the term, but it's how it was being used at, at the moment, BAME um, proportion, I think is now about 18%. And that's something we've been particularly trying to increase. We've had um, some questions about um, past papers, as they've been, been called, um, which I think are about the JAC selection mm -hmm. processes. Um, so James has asked about the, uh, the JAC formally publishing um, past papers for the critical analysis situational judgment tests. And he asked, why isn't that done anymore? I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. <laughs> um, if James wants to contact me, I'm easy to find. I will endeavour to find the answer. Okay, good. Um, in, um, in terms of GLD applications, is there any way for applicants to get hold of um, example application forms? I'm aware, not, not that I'm aware of, but I guess that would be um, quite difficult. That Again, we could, we could take that away, but it's already, you know, people have to be quite careful to maintain confidentiality as well mm. in the application. So, um, but, but you can be, you know, put in touch and uh, provided with a mentor um, so to speak to somebody else who's gone through it um, to get help that way. Yeah, I know I've, I've had a mentee before. Um, and I've shown them a sort of redacted version mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. my successful CPAM application. Mm -hmm and my previous unsuccessful C panel mm -hmm. application. <laughs> yeah. um, um, so they could sort of compare and contrast mm -hmm. and work out what worked mm -hmm. and what, what didn't. Mm -hmm. So the, the mentoring scheme might be mm -hmm. quite a good way to do that. How, how do you get on to the mentoring scheme? The, the panel council team and GLD will link you up with the mentor. Yeah. And 
the JC has a mentoring scheme as well, don't they? Um, we have a variety of things. So in um, collaboration with the Judicial Diversity Panel, we have a mentoring scheme. You can find all that on the website. We also have um, a targeted outreach scheme, which is where we have near miss candidates. So people who apply but don't get through, but aren't far off. Um, and particularly with roles where we're struggling to fill vacancy requests, we now have a team of ex-commissioners um, so that it's independent from the commission who will work with those candidates and people can, be, can apply um, to have that support as well. The, um, the, there's been a, a question, there'll be a couple of questions um, about what I might term skeletons in the closet. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one very direct question is, um, do you look at applicants' Twitter accounts? <laughs> no. Um, if an applicant's Twitter account has become the subject matter of a professional complaint, we would, that would come up because you're required to disclose that stuff under the character stuff. So through that route, but we wouldn't go looking at accounts. Uh, what about, um, uh, uh, I mean, we're looking at their application. Likewise, <laughs> likewise, yeah. there is an application form and our strong advice to uh, people is you know, fill out the questions mm -hmm. uh, uh, and response to what's asked for in, in the form. Yeah, and that's what goes before the selection board. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we've had a question about um, geography. Um, so the question is, what is the JSC's view of the difficulties some candidates have regarding geographical location if appointed? For example, um, if based in London, being appointed to sit in the northeast or vice versa, or vice versa. Is, that's a deployment point, which is. Um, dealt with by judicial office and something we have nothing to do with. As I said, some competitions are to recruit to a particular geographical area. So it might be the presiding judging Cardiff, for instance. Um, and then the, the advert makes that clear. But if it's the recorder competition, then we're asked to select X number. <laughs> we provide the recommendation of the top X from the pool who applied to judicial office is absolutely them and something we have no role in and no influence over what then happens about deployment, I'm afraid. Um, in, in terms of the, the regional panel competition, you, um, it's right that you apply for a specific region at the time of the application, but it's a single competition across all the regions. How does it work for the panels? Interesting question. Mm, that, yeah, that, there's the London panel one, and then there's the regional panels. Mm. That, yeah, I think two two separate competitions. Yeah. yeah. Um, but of course, I think you express preference when yeah. you apply, don't yeah. you? Say when you reach region, you're both. applying for. Yeah. yeah. You um, so you don't. You, if you're practically in Manchester, you don't accidentally find yourself on the Southwest Regional Panel or anything yeah. like that. <laughs> no. That's a relief yeah. for me. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> if you're applying for London, you could sort of, you'd have largely, it can be substantially connected. That's where your practice is largely in London, South East. Yeah. Mm. Um, we've um, had a, a few questions about the employed bar. Um, as a member of the employed bar with a predominantly advisory practice um, and in turn limited advocacy experience, realistically, what are the prospects of any future application? been successful, don't say which application, so I'm not sure if it's a judicial or a panel application. Um, I mean, perhaps before we commit to an answer, uh, maybe that uh, uh, poser of the question might want to be more specific. About, which, about whether they're applying for judicial. Uh, uh, absolutely, yeah. Do you think, I mean, I guess, um, supposing it, um, is an application for a panel appointment. Do you, do you think it matters if someone's had mainly advisory practice at the employed bar? I think there are some areas where we recognise that there, there aren't great, you know, so many opportunities for advocacy. So certain specialisms that is recognised, but then I think you know, then you're looking for people who can give 
you know, the best evidence in terms of references and so on as to your skills and capabilities. Mm -hmm. So there are particular areas where it is recognised, but advocacy experience is, is very important. Well, you always seem to be asking mm -hmm. PAC specialists mm -hmm. in appointment mm -hmm. competitions, and presumably mm -hmm. most, particularly C panel level tax specialists, mm -hmm. probably won't have spent mm -hmm. an enormous amount yeah. of time in court. So presumably it's possible. Yes. Yeah. And Brie, what about judicial appointments? In terms of judicial appointments, then your examples don't have to be in a court or tribunal advocacy situation. Um, and there are a number of examples. You've mentioned tax. There are a number of examples, for instance, of tax solicitors who have got appointments to the tax tribunal and two of them now on the High Court bench. Um, so it's not a requirement, it's a case of working out if you are not working in courts and tribunals, what your examples are, and that might be, I mean, to take an extreme example, um, and I can never remember the role, but the role that's military judges, there was an applicant um, in that context who was giving in the battlefield examples of their advocacy skills. <laughs> Nothing to do with courts or <laughs> tribunals, but very powerful evidence of their ability as an advocate, mm. as a lawyer in the battlefield, persuading seniors who wanted to do one thing, why they couldn't. Um, so, I mean, that's an extreme example, but it might be talking with, if you're an employed barrister, or solicitor in a firm, it's actually in a big corporate, actually changing around the policy in that organization by persuading and helping non-lawyers understand what legal constraints and risks were. So it, the point is the examples. Now, undoubtedly there are contexts in which lawyers work, which mean you will not have as much exposure to situations that will generate the examples and you'll have a harder job to find them, but that is what you need to do. And the fact they're not in a court or tribunal context of itself is not a bar. So there was a very specific question about whether experiences sitting as an arbitrator would uh, Absolutely. be considered judicial Absolutely. role. Um, but moving subjects again entirely, um, a couple of questions about disability. Um, specifically for judicial appointments in terms of disability, to what extent can the selection process or indeed the role in terms of accessibility to the building, et cetera, be adapted? I can't deal with the building. <laughs> Again, deployment, nothing to do with us. We're just receipt of vacancy request recommendations out. Um, but in terms of our processes, absolutely, we're responsive to people indicating um, what their particular challenge and difficulty is and finding ways to make reasonable adjustments in the selection process. Um, and a, a similar question, do, do you have any disabled representation on any of your panels? I'm not sure if that means selection panels or um, people who are appointed on an Attorney General's panel. Um, um, I, off the top of my head, I can think of one lay member who I know to be d disabled, but I don't know what the stats are. Certainly we wouldn't have excluded that. In, in terms of the um, DLT panel appointments mm -hmm. process, are there any adjustments that um, are made in terms of the selection process or even after appointment? I, th yeah, I think that there, people can speak to the panel council team and say whether they need adjustments to help you know, in terms of filling out the application form. But yes, and in terms of help afterwards I'm you know on the specifics I you know the, the, we, we would be always trying to do what we could to make reasonable adjustments in terms of access to buildings if it was coming in for meetings whatever. Mm -hmm. the um I suppose they're quite different selection processes aren't they because the mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. panel appointment application mm -hmm. is entirely paper-based a single yes. application form yeah, yeah. no interviews yeah. and so no, none of that um, whereas the JAC application mm. process is multiple mm. stages, isn't mm -hmm. it? And multiple tools. Mm. And the type and number of tools depends on the size of the competition, inevitably, the numbers that, that we're having to, unfortunately, whittle down. 
um, in order to meet the vacancy request. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose then in terms of um, more, more general questions, um, I suppose, first of all, is there anyone in the room who has a question that they're, they're, they're desperate to ask? Yes. You just wait for the microphone to make its way up so that people online can hear you. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, uh, when the speaker presented the article or the statement, it was being touched about the diversity and only one incident or scenario I, I do recall is like if there are, there are two applicants, those who are on same regarding merit or character and only that occasion, the person from the ethnic minority or BAME community will get the priority. This is an incident the speaker mentioned clearly is like the person has to come up to that level and only that occasion that person will be recruited or given priority over other. Is there any other issue or is there any other steps the Judicial Appointment Commission is has put it in practice to forward the ethnic minority community. This is my question. Is, is there anything else or is there, and I'll appreciate if there is a bit more explanation how the commission is uh, ad, trying to advance the ethnic minority group under the statutory duty of diversity. Um, in terms of the statutory duty, the duty is, so far as selection is concerned, to do it on merit alone. The duty in relation to diversity is in relation to increasing those available for selection. So that goes to the pool, not the selection process. And all the advice we've had is that in terms of once people are in the selection process, so far as the process itself is concerned, the EMP is the only, because that has a statutory basis, the only mechanism we can use to prefer underrepresented candidates. What we are doing in terms of activity on multiple, multiple levels is in terms of the process, constantly reviewing, stress testing, bringing other people in to look at each of the tools we use to look and see if they are causing a problem, to look and see how we can make them better, how we can make them function and ensure that as close as one can get. I always think perfection is something that doesn't exist, but we must all move to get as close to it as we can. I, I personally think truly objective recruitment because we're all human beings falls into the same category. We have to constantly drive to move closer towards it. So we are constantly testing tools, challenging tools, getting external um, experts to look at, getting interest groups to look at and review and trying different ways, measuring, monitoring, seeing what the results are. And then when we make a step forward, what's the next one, what's the next one? If I tell you that every single competition we run, there is an output at the end beyond the merit list and the recommendations, which is a learning point. It is embedded in the JAC that every single thing we do, we look at and say what worked, what didn't work, and whether it worked or not, what can we do better? What can be better for the candidate experience? What can be better in terms of the robustness and the fairness and the transparency of the selection, etc. So there is the constant looking and reviewing and trying to improve our processes. In addition to that, we engage with stakeholders in multiple ways. So we have been a key driver uh, in the patch system. We do a lot of outreach, 
both through things like the INS and SBAs, but also to particular interest groups to engage and talk with them. We invite those groups to get involved in things like the advisory board that looks at the materials. So we're constantly trying to find new ways of driving it forward and making it better. But as I say, in terms of the pure selection process, because the statutory duty is to select on merit alone, save for the equal merit provision, there isn't maneuverability. So the work has to be on the tools and encouraging the pool in and encouraging with stakeholders more opportunities to ensure that the diverse elements of the pool that are applying understand the process as well as possible in order to be able to do as well as possible in it. Just out of interest, I know that um, uh, your question was more directed towards the judicial appointments side of things, but um, I think it's a convenient point for us as well to talk about uh, the Attorney General's commitment to making sure that there are significant strides to uh, promote and deliver diversity as far as the membership of um, of uh, her civil panels are concerned. So each year, ahead of opening the competitions, uh, you know, for the regional panel, the London panel, so on and so forth, um, the uh, panel secretariat contact a number of organisations. So. Uh, it goes out to the Association of Muslim Lawyers, the Society of Asian Lawyers, uh, the Association of Asian Women Lawyers, the Society of Black Lawyers, the Black Barristers Network, the Association of Women Barristers, and the brilliantly named uh, Bar Lesbian and Gay Group acronym BLAG, which is the most brilliant acronym ever. And um, uh, we invite all of those groups to our recruitment events um, and uh, uh, someone called Simon Harker, who for a long time has overseen the uh, uh, panel council um, uh, issues within GLD, has been available to give a talk to all of those above organisations and indeed their members. And the Attorney General operates an equal opportunities policy in relation to those civil panels. The assessment process emphasizes the importance of making recommendations for appointment on the basis of demonstrable skills. And uh, this is motherhood and apple pie, but I'll say it anyway. The Attorney General appoints the best candidates solely on merit, irrespective of age, disability, gender reassignment, et cetera, et cetera, all of those protected characteristics. So uh, I just wanted to kind of shoehorn in that um, into the um, answer to your question. I don't know if you've got any kind of follow-ups in relation to that, or was your complete interest only on the judicial <laughs> appointments <laughs> side of things? If I do talk about an example is, I'm originally from Bangladesh and I'm from select one division. And that, that division was a couple of years back, like 20, 30 years back, mm -hmm. uh, uh, less percentage of people was capable to go to the university education. And when there was being established an university, Shah Jalal Science and Technology University, there was an allocation for for example, 10% student will get admitted in that university from that specific select division. And remaining 90% will come through the specific strict merit basis. And 10% student will get come through that allocation. So that was in my, in my mind, like, uh, is there anything like that? is available in this platform or not. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, we're almost out of time, sadly, which means lots of excellent questions we won't get a chance to um, answer. Their questions about contextual recruitment, neurodiversity, um, specific challenges and various very specific questions about aspects of the recruitment process 
Um, I, I think you all, all said that if there are specific questions that people have, there are ways of getting in touch both with the JAC and the, the panel team mm. at GLD to ask those questions. Absolutely. Um, so I think we can encourage anyone who has specific questions mm. about the application process, either for part-time judicial roles mm. or to be um, panel counsel, to, to get in touch and ask those questions and get the answers that you need. Um, I'm sorry that we haven't been able to cover every question that everyone um, wanted to ask. Um, that, I think, um, leads me to, to thank everybody. Um, first of all, our, our panel of speakers, um, um, Bree Stevens Hall, um, QC, from, um, on behalf of the JAC, uh, Lorna um, Robertson, Sean Wilson um, from GLD. I um, should also thank the Inn for hosting this fantastic event and um, Clara um, for organising it um, and the Inn team for making sure the technology worked, which I assume, <laughs> which I assume it did. But, um, <laughs> well, you're getting questions. <laughs> Something worked. Something's working, yeah. Um, um, to remind everyone um, that the, um, the whole event's been recorded. So if you um, if you want to watch it back um, um, and, and make detailed notes, whatever, um, then you can do it. Or if you've got um, friends or colleagues who are um, interested in the subject matter but who weren't able to make it, um, then they will be able to um, view the recording on the INS website once it um, goes up. Um, um, thank you to everyone who attended both online um, we had um, over 100 attendees um, and everyone who's attended in person today um, for those of you who have attended in person there is a short um, reception afterwards which